I am Bernard Dan, Editor-in-Chief of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. Today I'm having a conversation with my friend Tom Chow, following an editorial I wrote in the July 2017 issue of the journal about understanding the autonomic nervous system in cerebral palsy. Tom Chow is Vice President of Research at Holland Blueview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in Canada and Professor of Biomedical Engineering. Hi Tom. Hello Bernard. In my editorial, I addressed how little is known about the autonomic nervous system in CP, but also the potential to use it to help individuals with cerebral palsy in performing various activities. This has been the focus of much of your research. Yes, our context largely has been in finding ways for kids who are nonverbal to connect with their environment, to communicate So we've been interested in harnessing physiological signals, both from the autonomic nervous system but also central nervous system, to decode communicative intent. What sort of signals can you use? So we spent a lot of our early efforts looking at things like electrodermal activity, facial temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and in more recent years kind of shifted our focus to look at the brain signals. So all the first signals you mentioned relate to reactions or sometimes anticipation of the body to events. Is it right to say that you're trying to identify a body signature that signals some intention or reaction? That's correct. What can you then do with the signature? Can you use it to activate, say, a mobility or a communication device? Yes, that would be the ideal goal. We've come to the realization that for many the children that we work with, it's unlikely that they'll get to that point of being able to consciously modulate their physiological signals. I suppose it must be quite difficult to learn to modulate your autonomic nervous system, which is essentially involuntary, through voluntary actions or purposeful concentration. Yes, so that's the one approach which has proven to be very difficult and we haven't had much success, like with children with CP. But as I said, with able-bodied individuals, it's a skill that can be acquired quite quickly. But you also mentioned brain signals. Where I think there's potential is is combining perhaps some of the ANS information with central nervous information. There's two potentials that we've been really interested in and been able to detect. One is called the interaction error potential and the other is readiness potential that may complement what we see behaviorally and what we might see with the autonomic nervous system signals. Oh, I see. Then I guess you can record signals related to the autonomic nervous system, which are presumably easier to record and are strong, and combine them with EEG indicating preparation for action, that readiness potential. We can detect readiness potentials for fine motor activation, so something as subtle as a key press using one finger. So this is particularly useful for children who have athoid CP or hypokinetic CP, where there's a lot of involuntary movement. One of the most elusive questions to answer is whether a particular movement or switch activation is intentional or not. And now with the ability to detect the readiness potential, we have this additional piece of information as to whether that was a volitional movement or not. Because when the child has an involuntary movement, the readiness potential is actually attenuated. So this is a really important cue that we'd like to exploit. This is extremely promising. But I suppose you will need to rely on better documentation of the autonomic nervous system and readiness potential in cerebral palsy. Yes, that's correct. So we're just starting to do some pediatric studies right now. As with most of these psychophysical studies, folks have done the experiments on able-bodied individuals. We can't assume that the physiology is going to be identical in children with CP. And from our own studies, we've found that there are many differences. The intrasubject variability is quite high. Tom? How do you foresee the future, or indeed dream the future? Well, we've talked for many years about full-body machine interfaces, where we can monitor a whole host of physiological signals continuously over time. We firmly believe that even in the absence of speech and controlled gestures, the body is communicating. It's just that we're not tuned to pick up on those kinds of cues. And all the advances in instrumentation, particularly non-invasive instrumentation measuring brain signals, I think there's real potential that we could open up the world to kids who currently have no expressive communication whatsoever and give them an opportunity to participate in school and in the community. This is a great aim. Now, 
You talk about output, but communication goes two ways. Do you think we could use this to help individuals learn new skills? Absolutely. So we're actually thinking about this more and more. I mentioned that we've had little success in teaching people to consciously modulate brain signals, and that's a real potential. We've run some studies where we have taught people to consciously modulate regional blood flow in the brain over a series of five to ten sessions, and people are able to do this very, very accurately and repeatedly, and they actually retain the skill. So we did a one-month follow-up, and people retain the skill. So it's like acquiring a motor skill, like riding a bicycle. You don't have to think, you know, left foot, right foot, etc. We actually had people changing the color on the screen at will, and they didn't have to do a task. So in other words, they don't have to rehearse a mental activity. They simply just will the change, which is incredibly promising. As I mentioned earlier, we're starting to do some pediatric studies right now. So I think there's real potential that we could be teaching skills that are non-traditional. This is very exciting. We wish you much success, and we'll be following closely what you do. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Bernard.